We're going to finish chapter five today. And then we have the spring break. Uh, problem set number eight has been posted. So check it out. It's due Tuesday after spring break, which I believe is March 23rd. And uh, you guys are going to uh, pick the problems for the exam uh, on Monday. Sorry, that ex uh, problem set eight is to the Wednesday after uh, spring break. So on Monday, we're going to design the exam. So, you know, please show up on Monday and uh, please take a look at the problem set, you know, before that day, uh, ideally. So we're gonna do the same thing as before, you know, I'm going to ask for volunteers to lead uh, study sessions and you can get participation points. People ask whether participation points are extra credit. Extra credit is something that doesn't exist really. Um, typically, uh, if there is extra credit, it seems to me like it was not planned. So that's a bad thing. Um, if it is not, if, if you add things to the class that are not planned, then it's more difficult to predict the grade that you're gonna get. And you know, for a lot of classes, there's a there's a curve at the end of the class, right? So I mean, of the end of the semester. So I don't know if you get like an 83, you might still get an A or something. Uh, I do not like that um, unpredictability. So if there's a curve of, at the end of the semester and extra credit is being offered, then it is not really extra credit. You have to do it. Otherwise you're losing points relative to the other people, right? So that puts you in a competition with other people. So that's why, you know, I really don't like uh, extra credit. Everything in the class, in this class is planned. You know how many points there are. There's more than 100 points, so you can easily get an A. There are several ways to get an A. So you, know, you can plan accordingly, there's no surprises. But you know, just in case for other classes, remember that there's no such a thing as extra credit. If there's credit being offered, you have to take it. All right, so um, I'll step down from my soap, soap box. So we, last time, we derived the, the Gibbs factor. So the Gibbs factor is a little bit like the Boltzmann factor, it ha except that it includes the, the chemical potential, right? So it's gonna be the exponent of N mu minus some energy could be the energy of the state S. The state S will depend on the number of particles or sorry, the energy of state S. Uh, in general, it will be divided by the temperature tau and that is the Gibbs factor, right? So this was um, added is the extra thing. We also derive the equivalent of the partition function for the Gibbs factor. So instead of writing, um, what we call that Roman Z or whatever, um, we use the script Z. And so that is going to be equal to the sum and the shorthand notation, all states and numbers is how I kind of remember it, um, of the Gibbs factor, right? Exponential, um, N mu minus ES over tau. 
So these all states and numbers. And this is also kind of shorthand notation. All the numbers and all the states, which depend uh, on the number. So this uh, dependence on the number is important. Uh, important. Uh, you do not consider uh, states that are not allowed by, by the number of particles. So it is not a multiplication, really. You know, it's just if you have and sort of the each one of the each one of these squares you know, has different number of particles, and I will have different energy. Uh, you only count the ones that are allowed um, by n. Okay, so this one will not go into the sum. So we're going to look at uh, examples of that today. So, you know, these are big, um, big concepts, right? This is the, uh, this generalizes what we what we had done before with Boltzmann with the temperature, and you know it is called the grand canonical, so it pretty much includes uh, everything. Okay, so let's define this quantity. It's called lambda. So it is defined as the exponential of the chemical potential divided by the temperature. So this is called the, no, the thermodynamic. Um, absolute activity. Do we have any chemistry majors or people strong in chemistry? Maybe my pre-meds that who have taken uh, all sorts of chemistry classes. Have you heard about the absolute act or I guess the activity? Yes or no? Okay, it's a quiet class today. So this one is equation five point sixty. So the activity is something that you can measure in the lab for gases or things that behave as gases. And mm, chemists used a few concepts that are not really familiar with. Uh, they use like the fugacity and things like that. Uh, essentially things that are related to the pressure. Um, so we will see a little bit more about these. So um, for an ideal gas, the, the chemical potential mu is tau times the natural log of the concentration divided by the quantum concentration. And because of the relationships, Uh, followed by the ideal gas. This is also equal to the natural log of the pressure divided by tau quantum concentration. Um, temperature quantum concentration. Okay, so then lambda, 
and you know we derived this one before it's, it's equation uh, 5.12 uh, lambda is the or well, the exponent of this right so it's going to be uh, this mu it's going to be tau natural log of n over n q divided by tau. So the taus go away, right? This is just the exponent of this natural log. So the activity is equal to the ratio between the concentration and the quantum concentration. If we put in uh, P, well, it will be tau divided by tau, uh, pressure divided by tau quantum concentration, then this is pressure divided by tau quantum concentration. So just from the math uh, perspective, it is convenient to use uh, this definition of, of lambda. Although, you know, we're not actually defining anything new. This is just mu divided by the, by the temperature, chemical potential divided by the temperature. Okay, so I mentioned that you can measure the, the uh, activity in the lab and that is true. You can measure the pressure. You can also measure the temperature. The quantum concentration has terms like the mass of the particle, the temperature, and some constants like h bar and pi. So uh, you can also measure the concentration. Right? So the activity is something that you can measure in the lab. If you know the temperature, then you can also find the chemical potential, which is uh, pretty useful. So the uh, we're going to look at this problem. It's on page 140. Uh, mm, where's my other? This is the example, and it says uh, occupancy zero or one. So I like the pun uh, in the book. You know, if you couldn't believe it, Kittel and Cromer have a sense of humor. So they say that this is a uh, red blooded example. And I guess they mean red blooded as you know, real life uh, human. But uh, this is also literally about uh, myoglobin and uh, hemoglobin. So it's a cool pun. And so this system is occupied by zero or one molecules. So initially, hey, we're just looking at myoglobin. So myoglobin seems to be a pretty um, big molecule, I guess a protein. And I don't know how a protein look like, looks like. Uh, I, when I go to talks about biophysics, I just see these like things that are curled up. I don't know if you have seen them. But anyways, somewhere in this curled up complex, there is a site, which in my imagination looks just like a square. And 
And this site can be filled by an oxygen molecule. So in this case, we have the myoglobin, which is, this is the abbreviation for it. Then you have a oxygen molecule attached to it. And over here, you just have the, um, the myoglobin molecule with no, uh, with no oxygen. So myoglobin um, was the first uh, protein, I guess, for, uh, for, uh, whose structure was determined by uh, X-ray diffraction. And I don't remember who did it, but they won the, the Nobel Prize for that. And well, you know, DNA was more difficult to crystallize and to find and everything, but I, it was kind of the same approach, right? You are able to crystallize this molecule. And so you're able to determine uh, its structure by X-ray diffraction. So myoglobin uh, attaches oxygen molecules to the body. Thing is mostly in um, muscle. I think in humans it is not present in blood, but you know other animals they do have myoglobin, and it's used by whales and like seals and things like that, uh, who just spend a lot of time underwater. So they have a lot of myoglobin, and that's why they can spend so much time um, underwater. So this molecule. Well, this um, system has two different energies. So in this state in which it is not, uh, nothing is attached to it, we can say that the energy is zero. And in this uh, state in which the oxygen molecule is attached to the myoglobin, the energy is E. Do you expect this energy E to be positive or negative? Negative. Why? Well, I remember the hydrogen atom with the electron. And it was negative, like the negative 13.6 electrons. So when they get attached, it increases the energy. But what, what does that mean? It is negative, you're correct. Yeah. So I mean that you have to put positive energy, and you have to put energy to the system in order to take out the oxygen too. Right. So you know this looks kind of like a let's say if the zero is over here, this is gonna look like a potential drop, right? And this is gonna be uh, well, let's say minus, let's put a number in there, minus uh, I don't know, gamma. And so uh, the molecule can fall in here, right? And it will stay there. If you want to take it out of its binding site, you have to put energy. Um, oops. Sorry, my uh, microphone is running out of battery, so I'm going to look a little weird for a little bit. OK. Uh, so that is correct. So this is the situation. So we can, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to get the expectation value of the number of particles. 
Okay, so uh, we defined this one before. It's equal to um, sum over all states and numbers, n, and then the Gibbs factor. divided by the grand partition. So this comes from the definition of the expectation value that you know, we have been using since pretty much day one. So the grand partition function is sum over all states and numbers exponent of n mu minus es all that divided by tau. So we can divide it into a part that is uh, dependent just on the energy state and another one that depends. So this will be s. Another one that depends only on the chemical potential and number of particles. So by using the definition of lambda, we get we can rewrite the grand partition as the sum over all states and numbers of lambda n. So uh, lambda is this over here, so we just add the n and then exponent um, of the energy part. So I guess I can just use the e. e minus es over tau. So we know that. The derivative with respect to lambda of the grand partition is going to be the derivative with respect to lambda of the sum ASN lambda n e to the minus es over tau. So we can just, uh, since this is just a sum, we can put the derivative inside. Um, oh, lambda n. So uh, taking it out is gonna be e to the minus es over tau um, sum over all the states s and then sum over all numbers n derivative with respect to lambda of lambda n. So this is equal to, we can write the sum explicitly. So the derivative with respect to lambda uh, of lambda uh, to the zero, uh, lambda one, lambda two, and so on. And so what we're gonna get from that is, the first one is a constant, so just zero, and then the second one is uh, lambda, so it's going to be one. The next one is um, lambda square, so it's going to be two lambda. It's going to be three lambda uh, squared, and so on. 
So if we multiply this one times lambda, then we're gonna have sum over all the states, energy states. And then this one is just gonna be lambda uh, plus two lambda squared plus three lambda cubed and so on. And so that one, we can rewrite it as the sum over uh, all numbers of n lambda to the n. So that means that this whole thing Lambda times the derivative, uh, derivative of the grand partition is the sum over all states and numbers of n lambda n exponent of E s uh, over tau. So this is equal to sum over all states and numbers of n uh, exponent of uh, n mu minus es whole thing over tau. And that is what we had on top of the expectation value of the number of particles. Uh, Sorry, wrong button. Can you hear me and see my board? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. All right, so this means that the expectation value of the number of particles is equal to lambda derivative with respect to lambda of the grand uh, partition function times, because it was normalized, one over the partition function. So this part will be the, the um, logarithmic derivative so it's lambda derivative with respect to lambda of the natural log of the partition function. So this is equation 5.62. Okay. For the zero or one uh, occupancy case, we have uh, the case in which n is zero, so there is no particle in uh, at the binding site. And so the energy is gonna be zero. When there is one particle, then the energy is will be S zero and this will be S one. Could you repeat that? 
It is not mine. Yeah, mine seems to be working. Um, yeah, you're not trying, you're not sharing your, uh, your camera, right? Okay. Sometimes it, it gets really, really slow. Uh, it gets frozen when I, when I'm uh, using the camera in addition to sharing or someone is sharing. So, yeah. All right, so then we can write the partition function, the grand partition, whoops, um, explicitly. This is gonna be lambda to the zero, e to the minus zero over tau, plus lambda to the one, e to the minus e, um, well, this is ES1 over tau. And so that's it. Those are the only two states that we have. So this is an EC grand partition. This one is one, this one is also one. So the first term is one. And oh, now we don't need to distinguish the different states. We only have one state that contributes an energy. Uh, this is equal to just lambda. So it's lambda e to the minus energy tau. And this is equation, if you're following, 5.66. So that means that the expectation number of the number of particles is going to be uh, lambda. It's easier to take out the, um, uh, to put the grand partition back outside so that we don't have to take the natural log of these. Uh, so lambda divided by the grand partition derivative with respect to lambda of the grand partition. So this is just, you know, it comes directly from the definition. So it's a derivative of one plus lambda, lambda e to the uh, epsilon over tau. And so we take the derivative of that, it's gonna be equal to it's kind of an easy one, zero, the first term, plus e to the minus epsilon over tau. So we can rewrite the whole thing. Well, this one doesn't matter. It's gonna be one, uh, wait, not one, just lambda. Lambda e to the minus epsilon over tau divided by the partition function to so one plus lambda epsilon e to the minus tau. This one is equation 5.69. So uh, now we can do, it's not even a jujitsu, it's just like a, a little bit of um, maybe origami or something. Algebra, origami, we're gonna fold it. So this will be equal to lambda. So we can divide everything by lambda over, um, lambda times e to the negative uh, epsilon over tau. And so if we divide, in the numerator, we have to divide in the denominator. Right? 
So then we end up with a one up here. And then everything down here is going to be uh, lambda uh, to the negative one because it was dividing. Um, the e to the negative epsilon over tau becomes positive because now we're moving it up here. And the next one is just one. So this one is also equation 5.69. So uh, in the text, they mentioned that this quantity uh, can be called, you know, depending on the context, it might be called uh, F. And for the time being, you can interpret that this F means fraction. Okay, so now let's look at the application. So if we assume that we're looking at a, an ideal gas or something that behaves like an ideal gas, then uh, we can divide, um, what would this be? Yes, lambda. So lambda was um, pressure divided by tau quantum concentration. So then this is going to be pressure uh, divided by tau quantum concentration. This is what it means. So we can multiply it times the pressure over here and over here so that it is still equal to one. I mean, we're multiplying times one. So this is gonna be pressure. And then the uh, pressure is gonna go away with this one. This one, we can move it uh, over here. So it's going to be tau quantum concentration e to the epsilon divided by tau plus the pressure. We're multiplying the whole thing. And if we let p not be equal to tau quantum concentration e to the epsilon divided by tau, then the fraction or the expectation value of the number is p divided by p naught plus p. And this is, um, you know, nice, simple equation. We can put it around, we can put a box around it. This is equation 5.71. Have you seen this equation before? This is a pretty um, common form that you get for a distribution. So in this context, it's called the Langmuir absorption isotherm. Adsorption isotherm. So isotherm, uh, you know, because you do the experiment or you measure this curve at a given temperature. And it will be a function of the, of the pressure. 
And so you can also write it in terms of uh, the concentration. And this is an ideal gas. So in terms of the concentration, it will be, you know, put it over here, uh, N divided by NQ, quantum concentration, E to the E over tau plus N. So actually, we're going to be working a lot with this particular form, functional form. So this is also the form of the Fermi-Dirac distribution. And I don't know if you read uh, you know, that section uh, on the, the Fermi-Dirac distribution in the uh, boarding a plane paper. So the part that I didn't ask you to read was about how the passengers can stick right to their seat. So he used essentially this, uh, this approach. Uh, so does anybody in the class work with uh, works on adsorption? or has done research on adsorption? I guess that's a no. Uh, have you heard about the term? What does it mean? Crickets? Okay. I first heard it in chemistry, and just when uh, I guess particles are yeah, particles uh, attached to maybe a solid. Yep. So adsorption usually means that they're going to attach to a surface, right? So um, you know, let's let's check the the limiting behavior of the uh, lang Langmuir adsorption isotherm. So at very low concentration, sorry, very low, yes, very low concentration. So N is much smaller than the quantum concentration. Uh, this is equivalent to N, the concentration goes to zero. So the fraction, we're going to have a zero over here. Over here, we're going to have just the uh, quantum concentration, you know, that term. Plus, n is also going to be very close to zero. So, zero divided by some number is zero. Okay. The fraction, let's say that this is your surface, and you can divide your surface into, into squares. And if you have, you know, something like a transmission electron microscope, this is not a bad picture. You will see like the, the, the electron surface of the material, right? It's gonna look kind of like a, like little squares. So, you have some um, gas particles up here. If the concentration is very low, you don't expect any of these particles to attach to the surface. Uh, in the very high concentration, so the concentration is much greater than the quantum concentration this one goes to infinity. So this is going to be infinity. This one is going to be infinity. They're the same infinity. This one becomes negligible. So you have one. If you have a very high concentration, 
then you will expect this these particles to be attached to the surface to adsorb. So the situation that we have in the example is with a myoglobin and oxygen. So you can imagine that this surface is myoglobin and you add oxygen to it. And a certain number of particles is going to attach to the surface. And so this F is really the fraction of the squares that are covered that have a, a, a gas molecule, uh, oxygen molecule attached to it. Uh, does this describe what happens, for example, uh, in our lungs when we breathe? Yeah, right. So the molecule, I guess the, the protein, I don't know if this is, if it's really a protein, uh, hemoglobin, but I think it is. Uh, we use hemoglobin instead of myoglo myoglobin um, to get oxygen into our body. And so the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere is pretty much fixed. So if we want more oxygen into, to get into our body, what does evolution do for us? How did it solve that problem of you know, getting a lot of oxygen into our body? You get what? Yeah, that is an option, but hemoglobin, hemoglobin. but hemoglobin has a you know, a fixed size. So if you just had um, a surface, you know, flat surface of hemoglobin, then there will be a fixed number of oxygen particles that you can get into. Well, there is a fixed number of oxygen particles that you can get oxygen molecules. So what uh, evolution did was to crumble, right? This surface. So instead of being flat, it is like all crumbled like that. Well, probably not like that, but... right? And so in the same volume, you have a very large surface area. And you know, all of this is gonna be covered by hemoglobin. So the oxygen comes in, it can attach to the hemoglobin. Then you have, of course, your blood flow. So it's going to carry that oxygen into, into the body, right? So you know, this is kind of very, very cool. So um, you know, this is kind of a sad example, but let's say that uh, you know, someone has uh, COVID or something what's going to happen to the alveoli over here? Well, they're going to be covered with uh, excretion and stuff right from the virus and from the body trying to defend itself. So the surface area decreases that is available to, uh, to grab oxygen uh, you know, for a gas exchange. And so what do, you, what do doctors do? they put oxygen, right? So instead of having just a regular atmosphere with a regular concentration of oxygen, they can put up pure or very close, well, probably not completely pure, but you have a higher concentration of oxygen that you get in the, in the atmosphere. And so there's more gases, there's more molecules. And so the probability that is going to attach increases, right? So this, this is very uh, this is very general physics. Like it, it can explain a lot of phenomena uh, with it. So we have some interesting curves on 
so this is figure uh, 5.11. It looks kind of like this. Zero, two, four, six, and eight. So this is the fraction, 0 0.5, 0, and 1.0. Fraction cannot be larger than 1.0. And this is uh, concentration, and this is in arbitrary units. And, okay, so Kittel and Cromer figure 5.11. So they have the uh, isotherms for myoglobin. And you know, this is not in an organism. I think essentially they just put this thing kind of like in a jar. And so for 10 Celsius, it looks kind of like this. You see that? It's not super clear, but then for 20 degrees, it looks kind of like this. Uh, 30 degrees, it goes down a little bit here. Looks kind of like that. For 35, maybe it looks kind of like this. So uh, 10 Celsius, 20 Celsius, 30 Celsius, and this one is 35 Celsius. So what is this telling us? Well, this, the pink lines are the isotherm. So N divided by uh, N Q E to the E over tau plus N. So this N is, will be the concentration over here. And this is equal to the fraction. So uh, what happens, can you describe what happens at 10 Celsius, so lower temperature, to the fraction of, um, of myoglobin sites that are occupied? Well, at low temperatures, the molecules, the gas molecules will have less kinetic energy. That's the definition of temperature. So at each of these sites, you have a potential well. And you know if they have less than the energy of the potential well, they're gonna be trapped. They're gonna stick to the surface. So at low temperature, they have less kinetic energy, so it's more likely that they're gonna get attached to the surface. And then as you increase the temperature, the probability that they attach is less, and this is gonna be a dynamic, um, a dynamic process, right? Like some molecules are gonna be able to escape at some point, you know, gain some energy and escape. Uh, others are going to uh, occupy their places. But, you know, on average at higher, temperatures, the, the particles are going to have more energy, so it's more likely that they can just move away. And, uh, you know, this is also what happens when you have water, let's say, uh, on the street, right, after it rains. So in school, they tell you that water evaporates and it goes on to form clouds but they also tell you that water evaporates or boils at 100 Celsius. So how is it possible that water disappears, you know, at 25, 30 Celsius? Any take on that? I think it's, uh, and I think back to maybe some, I don't know, some chemistry I took a long time ago 
even though the temperature isn't reaching the boiling point, which means um, it's not equivalent to the atmospheric pressure, which means it'll boil. There are still molecules inside that have kinetic energy, and eventually one or two or three or X number of those actually gains enough kinetic energy to leave the liquid phase and enter the gas phase. And so little by little, you actually begin to evaporate whatever liquid, or in this case, water you have. Right. So we're going to see a more uh, formal uh, model of that, you know, when we, later in the, in the course, when we have coexistence of phases. But this gives you a simple model to explain that, right? So you can imagine that the liquid water is a surface. And so it, the surface is filled with, uh, with water molecules, but it is in equilibrium with the atmosphere. So there's going to be some of them that are going to be able to escape, like you mentioned. And since there's like wind and other things, you know, is there, is, it is not a closed system that water molecule is going to go away. And the smaller this becomes, you know, the easier it is for it to lose um, particles. It's going to be thinner and thinner. And so eventually it will just evaporate. So you don't need 100 uh, Celsius to evaporate water. You just need for it to be in equilibrium with the, the rest of the atmosphere. So that is the effect of temperature in general. The effect of concentration is um, as you increase the concentration, so there's more water, there's more, um, in this case, oxygen molecules, then the higher diffraction, right? And that is just, you can think about just the sheer numbers. So the number of times that a molecule is going to touch you know, another one on the surface, like um, myoglobin, is higher per unit time if the concentration is higher. So the probability that it attaches is higher um, per unit time. But also, uh, remember that the concentration in uh, an ideal gas is at the chemical potential, right? So if there's more molecules, uh, the molecules are, they, they, they wanna be as far apart from each other as possible. And so uh, if, if they're not absorbing into the surfaces of your box, you know, they cannot do much. But if you, had, if you have a surface that is absorbing them, they will want to be adsorbed because that decreases their chemical potential. So uh, that's, that's kind of cool. So the effect of temperature, and concentration. And there's another plot, uh, which will be 5.12, I believe, well, I imagine. So it's the concentration. On the x-axis, well, I guess in this case it's pressure, but it's the same as con concentration. Pressure of oxygen. And um, over here they call it percent saturation, but if you think about it, you know, it's just a fraction. So how saturated the surface is or the your sample is. And we have a curve for myoglobin that looks like this. It's just going up. And then there's another one for hemoglobin that looks kind of like that. And so what they say is that the myoglobin uh, you know, it's always just kind of uh, going up, uh, but the hemoglobin has a concave up part over here. And that's because hemoglobin has four binding sites for the oxygen molecule. But once a 
once there is one molecule attached to the hemoglobin, one molecule of, uh, of uh, oxygen, the binding energy decreases. So I guess it affects it, its uh, uh, electronic configuration. And so it is less likely that another, you know, not, not much less likely, but a little less likely that another oxygen is going to bind. And so you have this part that is uh, concave up. And so this is probably the main way, you know, by looking at these isotherms um, or one of the main ways in which people study gases. So interactions, chemical potentials, uh, all that good stuff. So this is, this is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty useful, I think. Let's look at another example. And this is going to be the second way to, to chapter six, which we're going to start next time. So this is uh, impurity atom ionization. Uh, in a semiconductor. So the situation that uh, is described is that you have some semiconductor material and you have your crystalline structure. And one of these atoms it's going to be an impurity atom. So let's say that this is silicon and you know at Intel when I worked there uh, they were crazy about copper. So let's say that, that is a copper um, impurity. So copper impurities really like silicon. So, um, and of course that's bad if you're trying to make a computer. So they have like these copper free zones. They're like really, really crazy about it. And they have like science everywhere and makes you think that copper is like this horrible thing. But anyways, so you have your semiconductor and you have your impurity. So the semiconductor is going to have a conduction band so, you know, you can kind of see the semiconductor as no electrons or no conduction, say no, no conduction. And no conduction over here. But over here, it's like a river. It's the, actually it's more like a, like a pipeline. So the, the electrons can be almost in their uh, free electron gas state. And so they're free to move through there. So the way computers work is changing the voltage, right? So that it goes from here, zero to here one. So current, current, no current, current, no current. And of course, it's pretty cool because they do this at, it's like, you know, 20 uh, nanometers or something like that. 14 nanometers, depending on what you believe. So the impurity is like, um, it's going to be over here, right? This is your impurity. And the impurity has one electron to share. So in a way, in a very real way, you have your reservoir over here and it's gonna be the free electron gas of the semiconductor. And over here you have your system, which is much smaller, 
has many, many less electrons than the conduction band. Uh, in fact, it has only one that it can share. And so it can uh, give it to the reservoir, so to the semiconductor, or hug it, right? take it. So just like we did in the example, in the previous example, you know, this situation has so few states that we can enumerate them. So the first one, the electron is um, detached. So that means that the electron goes into the band. So in that situation, uh, N and E of the state. The number of electrons is zero and the energy is gonna be zero. There's nothing there. And then there's another two, they're kind of the same. So here the electron is attached and the number is one. The energy, we're just gonna say that it's negative I. So it is negative also because uh, there's a binding potential. Otherwise the electron, the atom will never acquire an electron. And uh, attach but spin up. This one is the electron attach but spin down. One state and also negative I. Okay, so So the partition function, gram partition function is gonna be, because I'm gonna get rid of these. I may have to hurry up a little. So the gram partition is gonna be uh, exponent. of zero mu minus, and then we had a negative i, so plus i, uh, divided by the temperature. And then we have one mu plus i, oh, this one was not i, it was zero. It had no energy. Uh, so plus I over tau, that was the spin up. And then we had the spin down, which looked the same. So this is zero over tau, that is just uh, e to the zero, that's one. These two are the same. So it's two exponent of, this is just mu plus i divided by tau. So that is a partition function. And it's equation 5.72. Okay, so the probability that the electron is ionized, that means that this impurity doesn't have an electron, is the probability of zero particles, zero energy, 
there's only one. So it's going to be one divided by the partition function, grand partition. So it's one over this. The probability that it is neutral, so not ionized, is the probability that it has one uh, particle in the spin up state with energy minus i and the probability that it is it has an electron with spin down energy minus i we said that both of these are the same so it's going to be equal to uh, this part right two exponent uh, mu plus i over tau divided by the grand partition. So we have our equations. Let's check out the limiting behavior for this situation. In the high temperature, temperature limit uh, tau is much greater than mu plus i so the chemical potential plus the energy so the particles have a lot of energy the electrons and so the probability that it is Ionized is one over one plus two exponent. And then uh, we have mu plus i over tau. The tau is much greater. This kind of goes to infinity. So that whole thing is kind of zero divided by infinity. So this is close to one, or it's going to be one in the limit. So the probability that it is ionized is one third. So the probability that it's neutral is just one minus one third is two thirds. So what is going on there? Any explanation? So we have our surface, right? And we have the electrons, which in this case are, the gas is made out of electrons. There is a binding energy, each of them, or each of these sites. Um, but, the electrons have so much energy that it doesn't matter that these ones have some binding energy. So the only thing that the electrons see is, oh, there's two states in here. It can be like this, or it can be like that, or I can be free. And the energy barrier to each of them is negligible compared to the temperature. And so, you know, each one is the same. So you essentially just have those three, three states and the probability is one third for each one. The probability that is ionized, so it's three is one because there's only one state in which it is ionized and two in which it is neutral. So in the low temperature limit, here the temperature is much smaller than And the chemical potential has the binding energy. So we have the same expression over here. So one plus two exponent 
um, mu plus i over tau, one over that. Uh, but now this tau is kind of like it goes to zero. So this one goes to zero. So this thing explodes. This is going to be one over infinity. And so this is equal to zero. So the probability that is neutral is one minus zero, that's one. So if the particles have very low kinetic energy, so their temperature, then you know, this potential well looks huge to it. And so the probability that is neutral is zero, right? It just doesn't have enough energy to leave. So it's gonna be stuck in the neutral state. And you know, this happens in metals and semiconductors uh, also. You decrease the temperature, they're not able to do, to do much. Uh, so just uh, very quickly, the next one. In the low concentration limit, The n is going to be much less concentration. It's going to be much smaller than the quantum concentration. And you know the chemical potential mu is tau natural log of n over n q. So the probability that it is ionized, so it doesn't have uh, its electron is one over one plus two exponent. And then we have the tau over here, natural log of n over nq divided by tau. And so we can uh, get rid of that. Um, I guess in principle, we also have the, the i but this is just for illustration purposes. So this is gonna be uh, one over one plus two N over NQ. So this is gonna be NQ divided by NQ plus two N. So if N goes to zero, the probability that the atom is ionized is nq divided by nq is equal to one. So if you have your surface over here and there's nothing up here, the gain in entropy uh, when one of these electrons escapes is gonna be huge, right? Remember that the chemical potential is proportional to the concentration. So if there's nothing here, there's a huge pool, you know, to remove it from uh, from its atom. And in the high concentration, probability that is ionized goes to zero, just because there are so many electrons over here, they're going to push this one back into uh, its atom. All right, so. I'm going to stop recording.